Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's Cathedral in Prince Rupert. I'm David Lehman, the Bishop of Caledonia, and we gather on this, the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, the 15th of August, 2021, to offer our time of worship and praise. Our service today is found in the Book of Alternative Services as, and is a service of morning prayer. The Diocese of Caledonia ministers on and with 10 First Nations. The Haida, Shimshan, Niska, Haisla, Gitsan, Wisetwin, the Dalkani, the Sakani, the Dunija, and Cree, along with the Metis, a privilege we gratefully acknowledge. We invite you to sing the hymns, pray the prayers, and to reflect on the readings. Our opening hymn is, Come, let us to the Lord our God. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dear friends in Christ, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by God's infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. 
O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. God rules over all the earth. O come, let us worship. We say together the Jubilate. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. God rules over all the earth. O come, let us worship. Psalm 110 is appointed for today. We shall read the psalm responsively by the whole verse. Alleluia! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the assembly of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord, they are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures for ever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast for ever and ever, because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant for ever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. As David approached death, a struggle occurred regarding who should succeed him, his eldest living son, or he whom he had chosen, namely Solomon. David has confirmed that Solomon will be king. The first reading is written in the first book of Kings, beginning in the second chapter at the tenth verse. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was forty years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and thirty-three years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they can be, not be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, 
God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, all your life. No other king shall compare with you if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked. Then I will lengthen your life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing again, Blessed are the pure in heart. In discussing the difference between pagan and Christian life, the author tells us that the mark of Christian gathering is joy in the Spirit, expressing thanksgiving to God. The second reading is written in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, beginning in the fifth chapter at the fifteenth verse. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is At the Name of Jesus. Please join us.
Jesus has said that he is divine, the bread of life. The true bread from heaven, which gives life to all who believe, lasts forever. Belief in him, in this bread, is the key to eternal life. But belief is insufficient. We are also called to share eating his flesh and drinking his blood in the Eucharist. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to the people, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which our ancestors ate, and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our salvation. Amen. We have this summer a series of readings in the Old Testament and the New Testament that follow a train, a thread, a path. And we follow along listening to the stories of King David in the Old Testament, And right now we're working through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In the Gospels, we jump between John and Mark and the connections that are existing there between the Gospels and um, between the two Gospelers and, and the thread that sort of binds it all together. Today, I wanted to reflect back on the reading from Ephesians. Sometimes um, I like to switch it up a bit. Uh, Normally I like to preach on the gospel, but every now and then it's like some of the other readings are really appealing. And and I've uh, I've already tackled a bit on King David, and uh, we'll we'll come back to him again. But in the meantime, Paul is writing to us in letter to the Ephesians, and he has sort of divided the letter into two halves. The first half addressing Christian identity. The second half, which we're now addressing Christian character. There's a couple of things that sort of strike me about this. It's easy for us to say, I am an Anglican, I am a Christian, I am a blank. But that identity has to be marked by something. I cheer for the Edmonton football team. I've cheered for them for many years. I have struggled with their identity and their name over the years. And so when they changed and became the Edmonton Elks, and we'll put aside the grammar for that for a moment, I went out and got myself a new hat, the jersey that doesn't have any name on it, just the big double E, and um, a toque, because they have the best toques. Um, And there was something else I picked up. Anyways, I went and bought those. Recently, I was challenged for wearing them in public because they are a racist team. And yeah, there's no denying that their old name had racist elements to it. And yep, it was a problem. It was a problem for me as a fan. So why cheer for a team? Why identify with a team? Partly, well, I wanted to see a change. And I didn't think I could have a change without being identified with them, without being 
a fan without being a season ticket holder and not being able to apply some pressure. And two, I think the work of reconciliation is a long, hard process. And that when small victories come, we need to rejoice and celebrate them. Now, I may be off on this, and honestly, as a middle-aged white guy, that's who the CFL appeals to, I could be wrong still. And I welcome anyone wishing to correct me that I need to push harder and maybe cheer for the Lions. Um, I think that's just too unbiblical, which is a joke, and I made that recently, and somebody took me very seriously, and they felt very badly, um, but it is a joke. Uh, I just... I like the team because of who they are and how they're owned and how they're operated. And so I identify with them on several levels. I identify with being a CFL fan. And, and so I carry some of that identity out into the world with hats and jerseys and such. But it's not always an easy place to be. And I think as a Christian, when we say that we identify ourselves with Jesus Christ, when we say that we are baptized, People identify us in a certain way. They have expectations of us. We may have expectations of ourselves. And we come and we live into that in many different ways. And so as we identify ourselves and we claim that we are indeed a child of God, a brother of, or sister of Christ Jesus, and that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and that we live in the life of the Trinity, Paul tells us in, Corinthian, or in Ephesians that that should be reflected in our character, that our actions should flow out of this identity, that if we believe and hold fast and, uh, and acknowledge that Jesus Christ came for, our, for us, paid the atoning price for our sins on the cross, gives us an opportunity to become co-heirs in the heavenly realms that our character should reflect this. And I think he's right. I think if we want to be people of reconciliation, we have to work and push and make that happen. And so that's part of what I did as a fan of the Edmonton football team, the Elks. And that is, I think, what I really try to do day by day as being a Christian of coming back and saying, how is my character? How am I living out this faith? And sometimes I do well. Other times I fail miserably, which is why we have in our baptismal vows, when we sin, we repent and return. That we have to have this constant movement in our lives of coming back to God because we know we're not gonna get it right. And that is part of that identity. That is knowing that we ourselves are not God. We ourselves are not perfect. We ourselves are in need of salvation at every turn. So the first thing I think when we talk about Christian character is that one, we have to, at our very core, our very center of our being, know, know that we are a beloved child of God that we have to know without, I want to say room for doubt, but there's always doubt, but we have to know that God loves us through and through. Jesus didn't go to the cross because, well, it was that day. He had nothing else to do. He didn't go to the cross because, well, he was kind of hoping that we'd earn it at some point. He went to the cross because he knew how broken we are how unworthy we are, and yet how loved we are. We are so loved by God. And we need to know that in the, in the center of our character, the core of our being, we need to know that God loves us through and through, without reservation, without doubt, without conditions, without anything, utterly, unconditionally, totally. We, you, are loved by God. Knowing this, living into this, all the other things begin to take form. And we can begin to ask ourselves, what is it that we hold as a Christian character? 
What is it that we look to in the Christian leaders, in the saints who are around us, and the saints who have gone before us, that we see as those qualities that we wish to emulate in our lives? What are those things that we want to hold dear? And for each of us, that list may be a little different. For each of us, that list will be formed by our experiences, but more importantly, by the gifting God has given us. The Holy Spirit is at work in our lives and is gifting us to do ministry in ways that we can and cannot comprehend at times. If someone had said to me four years ago, I'd be standing here in an empty cathedral talking to a, an iPhone and recording a service for the people of the Diocese of Caledonia and further afield, I would have given a very quizzical look, laughed and walked away. But God's up to something in my life and God's up to something incredible in your life. And we have to know this and, and trust that the Spirit will guide us and give us the strength to do the ministry that has been set out for us. Sometimes, and this is, I think, one of the drawbacks to looking to the saints, we see the big stories, we see the great things, we see the people who founded major movements in the church, did incredible uh, miracles in some areas, but it's the quiet, small lives. I don't even want to say small, it's just the quiet, ordinary lives of those who are being transformed from glory to glory, from grace to grace, whose lives are about getting on with it and living the ordinary life that I think are the true miracle makers. Those who are having to make those decisions about what it is, what is true Christian character and living that out. And by being able to be honest with ourselves and know that yes, we fall short of the image of God. We certainly fall short of the image that others have for us. I'm always reminded by I say to someone, hey, have you thought of coming to church? And they respond by, no, churches are full of hypocrites. And of course, you know, me, I want to say, well, there's always room for one more. Uh, but it's that expectation that churches are museums of saints as opposed to hospitals for sinners. And that we're coming with an expectation, with a longing, with a deep desire that God will be working in us and through us, bringing us into holiness and to righteousness. So the question I have today is, what is God laying on your heart? What thing is God saying to you? You need to repent of that. What is one thing that God's saying to you that, you know, here is a strength you have. Play into it. Rejoice, know that I've made you this way and that you are a blessing to those around you because of this gift. And what ways are we being called to grow and to know that God is there with us, leading us, blessing us, gifting us, and that our character will reflect the faith that we have for better, for worse, and so we need to come back to know that you are loved and that God is doing great things in your life. Amen. Thank you for your continued financial tithe support of your parishes and the diocese. As we continue to reopen and return to in-person ministry, these funds are crucial to our operation and to the advancement of Christ's kingdom here on earth. So thank you. If you're looking for ways to contribute, please talk to your local congregation about electronic fund transfers, post-dated checks, or websites such as canadahelps.org or PayPal's charities. Again, thank you. Our offertory hymn is Thou Who's Almighty Word.
together we say, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us confess our baptismal faith as we say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of salvation, who graciously feeds us with the bread of life, hear our prayers on behalf of all those in need of your sustenance. In peace let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Catholic Church throughout the world, especially remembering Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, Linda Nichols, our primate, Lynn McNaughton, our metropolitan, and David Lehman, our bishop, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For presbyters, deacons, and all who minister in Christ, and for all the holy people of God. In the Anglican Communion cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of Southern Africa. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the Stuart Nechako Lakes Regional Parish. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy gathering, for all who worship in person today and for all who enter with faith, reverence, and fear of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this country, for all nations and their leaders and for our communities, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in danger and need, the sick and the suffering, prisoners, captives and their families, for those who are hungry, homeless and oppressed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For individuals, families, and nations, and for all care providers as COVID-19 continues to take its toll directly and indirectly, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For war-torn Afghanistan as the Taliban continue to make advances, let us pray to the Lord. For all those in our province, across Canada and around the world who are affected by this year's wildfires, for those who have lost their lives, for those who have lost their homes, for all those displaced from their homes and for those who risk their lives on the front lines fighting the fires, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those dealing with other devastating forces of nature, especially wind and rainstorms leading to loss of life, injury, and loss of property. And for those dealing with drought and insect infestations affecting food security for themselves and for all those who depend upon what they produce. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those known to us in any need who we now name aloud or in the silence of our hearts, Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have died, for the dying, and for those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For ourselves, our families, friends, and companions on the way, and for all those we love, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
giver of life. Feed us and strengthen us with your word, that we may have the courage to feed the needs of others generously and faithfully. Amen. Together we pray for the mission of the Church. Draw your Church together, O Lord, into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, together serving Him in His mission to the world, and together witnessing to His love on every continent and island. We ask this in His name and for His sake. Amen. The Collect for this day. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and sent into our hearts the spirit of your Son. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that all people may know the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, and in the language closest to our hearts, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our time of worship today. We pray that you'll continue to gather with us as you have opportunity throughout the week. Monday to Saturday at 12.15 from here in the cathedral, we have a service of midday prayer. You'll find that on the cathedral Facebook page. At 9 p.m. nightly, you'll find me in, the, in my study leading a prayer of service of prayer of Compline, again on the Diocesan Facebook page, or later on on our other social media platforms. We invite you to join us as you're able. We give thanks for those who've been able to worship with us today and for those who help bring the service together. We pray God's blessing be upon you this day and this week. For the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and indeed forevermore. Amen. Our concluding hymn today is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Let us go forth singing.
Let us go forth following Jesus. Thanks be to God.